Wine and Crime contains graphic and explicit content which may not be suitable for some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. listening to Wine and Crime, the podcast where two friends chug wine, chat true crime, and unleash their worst Minnesotan accents. You darn tootin' they do. Darn tootin'. Mm-hmm. And you know what I love about this episode? What? That we fucking picked the topic. We did. And you know what? <laughs> it's reminiscent of things we've done before. It is. But we get to explore some really wild shit. Mm -hmm. So I'm ready. I should say, before we get too far into this, uh, I'm Lucy. Oh, right. I'm Amanda. (laughs) One of these fucking days we'll get there. We're going to get there. Um, But yeah, like Amanda mentioned, we've covered uh, similar things before. Mm -hmm. um, But this is a little bit different. And we are... Today, presenting you with Mommy Dearest Crimes. Yup. In honor of Mother's Day. Correct. So, happy Mother's Day. Happy to Mommy's all you moms Day. Out there. All you special moms. Oh, it's my first Mother's Day. That's wild. How's that feeling? I keep reminding Corey that it's my first Mother's Day <laughs> in the hopes that he'll remember. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I bet if he door dashed me a egg McMuffin and just present it to me in bed and your then standards took are, June downstairs for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> your standards are, I would say, quite reasonable. Yeah. That's a pretty reasonable request. You want breakfast and to be left alone. Yes. That's isn't that what every mother that's, wants? I think that's what every person wants. Yeah. hmm I I True. want that. True. What? I don't. I mean, I'm a I'm a mom of of fur children, and I want that. You're a fur mom. I'm a fur mom. I'm a skin mom. <laughs> <laughs> hate that. <laughs> really, my, my skin baby. Hate. No, 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 no. <laughs> nope. This is not. <laughs> no. Great. It's as offensive to me as the term fur baby. That yeah, no, I hate the term fur baby. I only said it <laughs> as a joke. It just weirds me out. But I do have an unhealthy love for my cat, and uh if something happened to her, I would need to be put into a facility. I mean, you're on the edge, you're skating on the edge with that one anyway. Twenty four hour surveillance would be needed <laughs> if anything happened to my baby who is Somewhere in this room right now, probably terrorizing the rabbit. A maximum security. Yeah. Facility. Institution. Institution. Correct. <laughs> Correct. I love it. Mm, I love it, too. Okay. So I'm very excited about this episode. Let's kick it off with our wine crime pairing, if you don't yeah. mind. Oh, I don't mind at all. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to discuss something that might be a little controversial. Mm. But we... We're open to challenging conversations on this podcast, and (laughs) we're going to have them, and this won't, by any stretch of the imagination, be the most challenging conversation that we probably even have on this episode. Oh. Um, But I, while I was looking for a pairing for today, I saw a lot of stuff about, like, the wine mom trope. Like the culture. Yes. And how it can be very problematic and um, not only misogynistic, but also sort of like waving away or undermining substance use disorder Mm -hmm. and kind of making like a playful joke out of overworked overstressed specifically like woman figures in a household having to cope Mm -hmm. by drinking wine which like as much as we love wine if you're you know it's it's worth evaluating if alcohol is something that's at the top of your list of coping mechanisms then that can get into some 
on healthy territory. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to like look into this whole wine mom thing because it felt really new um, as like a culture, as a as a trope. But I just kind of wanted to get a handle on like where this came from and what this is all about. So there are obviously a lot of articles that are very opinionated about this. I avoided those. I really I'm starting just like with the basics. It's just I'm really just going into like the Wikipedia so we could figure out like where this came from and kind of what it is about. And then people can formulate their own opinions on the whole wine mom thing. But it's been very much in the zeitgeist. Like I even remember not so long ago, um, a Saturday Night Live sketch where I think it was like 80 Bryant. Um, they were like celebrating her birthday and everybody. It's a really funny sketch, but everybody was giving her birthday presents and they were all these signs like those oh, fucking yeah. chooky like I've wooden signs <laughs> that are like not without my wine and like uh-huh. wine mo- it, was, it was just like whoa this is like a <laughs> thing it's a total thing so wine mom is a term that is used to describe typically up an upper middle class mother often with young children who turns to alcoholic drinks to cope with being overworked or fatigued from parenting Alternatively, the term wine mom may also be used as a label of self-empowerment. So, yeah, it is kind of an interesting term Mm -hmm. because, like, some folks find it problematic and offensive. And I totally understand why that would be. And others are like, it's kind of like reclaiming it, like, yeah, making it like a funny thing. And I and like whatever helps. (laughs) Right. I also understand that. And like, Mm -hmm. as long as you are okay and you're getting support and you're not like harming yourself and or your, others i don't give a children shit what you, are safe <laughs> yeah i don't give a shit what you call yourself you want to call yourself a wine mom and you're a mom who likes wine fucking go off queen mm-hmm. as a label of self-empowerment or as a means of finding acceptance by others in a social group which brings up like such an that's such an interesting conversation especially in the west and especially in the united states about how much of a social crutch alcohol is and oh, how yes. alcohol in just the baseline social structure is such a key component across Mm -hmm. so many cultures it's wild yeah it really is when you think about it especially like from a like a global perspective Mm -hmm. like you go to you know places in the middle east they don't drink socially right you know a lot of uh, it's banned in a lot of in Mm -hmm. some places but like yeah particularly in the west in the u.s in europe Mm -hmm. it's like Ooh, if we're if we're not drinking when we go out, what are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing? How do we let our guard down? How do we connect with each other? Like, what's yeah. the common thread? Mm-hmm. While this term is most frequently used to describe parents, its usage extends to other individuals as well. The term may also be used in a self-descriptive manner, and it is not necessary for a third party to label one as a wine mom. <laughs> the term wine mom first came into popular use during the COVID-19 pandemic, though the term's origins date back to at least pre-2016. Factors that have been considered relevant by commentators include working full time at home. So I could totally see how the pandemic would absolutely fuel oh, yeah. this kind of wine mom like movement. And your fucking kids are at home. You're homeschooling. Yeah. And you're working from home. Child care is closed. Mm-hmm. School is closed. Uh, or remote work Mm -hmm. is remote and a lot of the emotional labor and the physical and psychological labor of running the household does disproportionately fall to the 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 female figure in the house in like Mm -hmm. nuclear homes and so i kind of get it why this would come from here i completely get it Loneliness and lack of social interaction in a home or apartment due to covid19 restrictions being a single parent Raising one or more children, lack of personal space or privacy. Ugh. Just lock myself in the bathroom, chug a glass of wine. Exactly. (laughs) Social pressures or conformity to drink, general feelings of overwhelm, the perception that wine is a healthy alternative to other alcoholic beverages or more socially acceptable, which we have talked about that as well. Mm -hmm. There are actually a lot of health benefits to like red wine. But Mm -hmm. obviously anything in excess is going to have an adverse effect. Mm -hmm. This seems to fall in a similar zone as like the Karen terminology, the OK Boomer terminology. It seems to like be a very specific subset 
of like elder millennial into boomer age group. Mm -hmm. And obviously that just kind of makes sense because we are among folks of now like pretty common parenting age. But yeah, I just think it's really interesting. And there are a lot of articles out there from individuals, specifically women who have shared their experience. Like there's this one article from Amanda Monty that was published in 2021 entitled, I became a pandemic wine mom. Here's what I learned. Another from Arena Gonzalez, wine mom jokes can be funny, but they mask how overwhelmed mothers are right now. Mm -hmm. I just feel like this kind of trope or joke is rooted in serious discrepancies in the like distribution of labor, I mean, through a like heteronormative lens, specifically between men and women in those kind of nuclear family relationships and how easy it is to reach for something that can kind of help numb all of that overwhelm and that pressure and stress. And it just kind of makes you feel normal and adult. Right. It's like, I have control over so little in my life. I'm just gonna, I can control pouring myself this glass of wine and taking a fucking moment for myself. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm not a parent, but I can definitely relate to that. I, I just felt like it was an interesting concept that fit well in this episode that I wanted to bring up and also connects with the pairing that I chose for today. And also just a reminder to folks that we do have a lot of recovery resources on our webpage. So if you are wondering or considering or questioning your relationship with alcohol or other substances, that is okay. And that is totally normal. And there are so many incredible resources to help you understand and get a plan set for uh, what is going to be best for you and your loved ones moving forward so that you can maintain your own health, both physically and mentally. And that's at the end of the day, we don't care what substances you choose to imbibe in. We certainly imbibe in plenty. Mm hmm. We only care about your health and your wellness, and uh, we want to support like all of the <laughs> spectrum of how that looks for people. And recovery looks different to everyone. You know, my husband does not drink anymore. He quit drinking in 2020, and we're mostly a marijuana household, and that has been a very good decision for him, both physically and mentally with his health. And so there are like lots of I feel like it should just be more normalized and accepted that not everybody needs to drink alcohol. Not everybody needs to, you know, buy into the the like American pressures to drink socially. Like if your choices are your own and don't let anybody judge you for any of them, as long as you're not fucking hurting yourself or other people like we don't give a shit what you do. We just want you to yeah. take care of yourself. Yeah. Oh, that's the perfect match for today's episode. I also saw a headline recently that weed moms are the new wine moms. I love that. Mm -hmm. I'm a weed mom. Yeah, you are. A I'm, weed more, mom. I'm more a weed mom now than a wine mom. I was definitely a wine mom. <laughs> but I also in my search found this really cool website because I wanted to explore some more NA alternatives for myself. And I found this super rad non-alcoholic sparkling wine line that looks delicious and fun as hell. It's called Yum. Badass Mom. Oh. And you can order it on badassmom.com. And they do all non-alcoholic sparkling. So you can do rosé. You can do more of like a champagne style. They have really cute merch and tumblers. Um, cute. A lot of their, their website. Their, mar their website's really cute. A lot of their marketing is for people who are pregnant, yeah. which is awesome. But like, you don't have to be pregnant to m choose an NA alternative when that suits you. Mm -hmm. So these just looked really fun. And then they also have these bundles that you can buy. They have wine party packs. So like if you're putting together a baby shower or, you know, just a oh, hangout baby shower, that's such a good idea. Yeah. I mean, I helped a friend with a baby shower and I did a mimosa bar and it was hard for me. Mimosas. To, mimosa. It was hard for me to find good N.A. sparkling in a liquor store. I did find some, 
so that there would be a selection. But this stuff looks awesome and could eat, be an easy, delicious alternative if you still want to like celebrate and have your bubbles, but you want to avoid some of the alcohol. Badass Mom is an incredible brand. It looks so delicious. So check them out at badassmom.com. Fantastic. What a weird wine segment. But you know what? I'm just I'm I'm just exploring things, you know? I'm I'm trying I things that are new. I think it's perfect. And I think the wine mom thing can be, it can be derogatory. A, da- a, a damaging trope. Yeah. And like you said, it doesn't it just puts like a happy sheen on something that could very easily escalate into a a serious problem. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's important to uh talk about not just have it be a punchline. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if exactly. it's if it's your punchline, great. That's you do you, boo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I it's like noon, so I'm drinking sparkling water right now, personally. Uh-huh. But yeah. I got my huge Stanley. But I am. <laughs> it gets bigger every time. It literally is fucking growing. That thing is ridiculous. <laughs> it's growing something. No, it's not. I wash it all the time. I'll definitely be getting my wine mom on tonight because Blortney and I are definitely going to see Tom Sandoval's shitty band. <laughs> so jealous. We're doing one of those like, we're going to check it out so you don't have to <laughs> moments. And I have my Ariana Maddox 1-800-BOYS-LIE t-shirt to wear. Yes. Uh- so, uh, yeah, I'm I'm saving myself for like, the two cocktails and the joint that I'm going to have tonight to really to cope with the sound of Tom (laughs) Sandoval's voice. (laughs) He's going to get so sweaty. Oh, it's going to be vile. I am not getting close to that stage. I want to keep a safe distance. (laughs) You get blasted in the face with like a trumpet. I don't want to get trumpet blasted. I don't want to see his nipples too clearly. I don't want to experience any droplets of any kind. Oh, yeah, no. No, no, no spray. No spray. No mist. So, yeah. Um, you're going to have to tell me about the merch table, though, because... I'll send you pictures. You know I love merch. I'm not going to buy any of it because I'm not giving him more Just money. Just send me a picture of I'll send you offerings. a picture. If you want to send him money, you can Venmo me and then I'll pay... I'll get you the merch. That's what I'm getting at. You monster. Okay. <laughs> you're paying him. You're going to his show. That's why I said I don't want to pay him more money. Oh, okay. I'm doing this as a sacrifice for (laughs) my VPR homies. It's like, yeah, it's like going on safari. I'm taking one for the team. I have to experience this moment in the cultural zeitgeist. And I would regret it if I didn't say yes when asked if I wanted to go. Well, you're also balancing it out with seeing Phaedra on Sunday. I am seeing Phaedra on Sunday. Oh, God bless. It's going to be a good weekend. Jealous. All All right. right. Well, let's get to our breaks. We can get to Sandoval sooner. Let's do it. Let's hear a quick word from our sponsors. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And Talkspace, the leading virtual therapy provider, is encouraging people to talk it out in therapy. Mm -hmm. Opening up to a therapist might feel uncomfortable, cathartic, exhausting, or exhilarating. People have all different experiences But Mm -hmm. one thing is certain, if you keep talking or texting with a licensed therapist, you'll gain insights and uncover truths that you can only find in therapy. Get those personal breakthroughs and judgment-free support by signing up for Talkspace. Talkspace has been a game changer in my life. I've been using it for, what, six, seven years now? A long time. They were our very first sponsor. Yeah. And I've had the same therapist. She's phenomenal. It just works so well for me it's so easy i just i just encourage everybody to try it and at talkspace.com you could sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you typically within 48 hours and that quick turnaround can be so life-changing for people it's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions with your licensed therapist from the comfort of your home i personally love the texting Because then as things arise for me, I can send them to her without having to go over like an inventory of loose anxieties in my head once a month, you know? Mm -hmm. And then she just gets to it during her office hours. It's literally perfect. And therapy can help you shift your perspective. It can help you find tools to cope in difficult times and just be a guiding light. And they have so many skilled therapists 
that are ready to work with you. Talkspace can help with any specific challenges that you might be facing. It's the number one online therapy platform, and they have licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, check, depression, check, relationships, check, substance use disorders, so much more. Talkspace is secure and private. They're using the latest end-to-end bank grade encryption technology to store client information and comply with the latest HIPAA regulations. And Talkspace is very affordable and also in network with most major insurers, which is huge. To celebrate May Mental Health Awareness Month and the power of talking it out in therapy, Talkspace is offering every listener of this podcast $80 off your first month with promo code SPACE80 when you go to Talkspace.com slash gals. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com slash gals to get 80 bucks off your first month with code SPACE80. And to show your support for this show, that's Talkspace.com slash G-A-L-S code S-P-A-C-E-8-0 and treat your brain. Treat it. Y'all, I am obsessed with convenience when it comes to my (laughs) cleaning and most things and most things and that convenience goes beyond just like delivery of supplies refillable items it's like i love the laundry tab sensation but did you know that like detergent pods for laundry or even dishwashers are wrapped in plastic like that film around the pod that dissolves is plastic and it's ending up in our oceans, rivers, soil, our bodies. Yeah. We're eating and drinking about a credit card's worth of plastic a week, babe. I can't. That's my Roman Empire. I can't deal. I never stop thinking about it. So what I love about Blue Land is they combine that convenience of like tossing a tab in the laundry, tossing a tab in the dishwasher. But they set out to do something about the freaking plastic. And they're trying to eliminate the need for single-use plastic in the products that we reach for every single day. And I'm obsessed. Blue Land is on a mission to eliminate single-use plastic by reinventing cleaning essentials to be better for you and the planet and our bodies with the Mm -hmm. same powerful clean that you are already used to. Blue Land uses no single-use plastic in any component. So that's the bottles, the tablets, the wrappers, like the shipping materials. Mm -hmm. Their tablet packaging is fully compostable. Blue Land products are effective and affordable. Like, I have I know a lot of these brands, they just don't really cut it. You know, they say they're eco-friendly, yeah. but you're like, mm, but the chemicals really work. I'm like, you know. But uh, they, these are truly, you can feel good about, like, the results that you're getting as well as the good that you're doing for the planet. We've been using Blue Land products exclusively for all the cleaning in our house for, like, four years now. It's, it's our favorite. I don't even like the like smell or the results from stuff I was buying at the grocery store now. Yeah. And it's totally changed the game. Uh, I can't get over their dishwasher tablets. Either. They're the best. They're proven to perform on baked on, burnt on stains. There's no rinse aid needed. Y'all, I put my dishes in the dishwasher nasty. <laughs> okay. Yeah. They work. They definitely work. You can get even more savings by buying refills in bulk or setting up a subscription. Highly recommend the subscription. These are customizable and convenient so you never run out of your most used products. They just show up when you need them. Mm-hmm. Blue Land is trusted in over a million homes, including ours. Blue Land has a special offer for our listeners right now. Get 15% off your first order by going to blueland.com slash gals. You won't want to miss this. Blueland.com slash gals for 15% off. That's blueland.com slash gals to get 15% off and treat your clean. Treat it. So the other day I got a very helpful email and most emails are not helpful. But, but this one said, hey, just FYI. One of your, the price of one of your subscriptions has increased. Mm. And I'm like, oh my God, this is like actually useful information. Mm-hmm. Also, which subscription is it? Right. And will you get rid of it for me? Because I probably don't use it. So I logged into my Rocket Money account and I could see exactly what that was al- alert was about. And I decided, mm-hmm. you know what? This specific app this. isn't worth an extra $4 a month. So no. Hey, hey, Rocket Money, please cancel this for me. And it did. Bye-bye. It's a concierge service. 
It truly is. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions. It monitors your spending and helps lower your bills so that you can grow your savings, babes. With Rocket Money, we have full control over our subscriptions and a clear view of our expenses. So like, I love how I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, see if there's something I don't want, get those alerts like you mentioned when something changes in price, specifically when it goes up. Mm -hmm. Rocket Money can then help me cancel it with a few taps if I just want to get rid of that service. I also love how the dashboard shows me my month spending compared to previous months so I can see clearly like what my habits are and, you know, maybe see what I could trim in the future. I love that. Yeah. They also help you create a custom budget to help keep your spending on track. So say you're planning for, I don't know, a wedding, which I'm still traumatized about. (laughs) <laughs> what I I really could have used more help <laughs> at that time, and I was not smart. If I had had rocket money, I really feel like that process honestly could have gone differently. But if you're like planning for a trip, a vacation, <laughs> a, a big event, whatever, this is such an awesome tool to help you reach your goals and keep your spending on track. And rocket money will even try to negotiate to lower your bills for you by up to 20%. So all you have to do is submit a picture of like a recurring bill and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. They will deal with customer service for you. And if they can get you a lower rate, they'll they'll do it. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of 500 m- 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 million in canceled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all of the app's features. That's that. Like I said, that's a trip. That's a more than a weekend away. Mm hmm. Get it. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash gals. That's rocketmoney.com slash gals. One more time, rocketmoney.com slash gals. And treat your spending. Treat it. Welcome back. And I'm very excited for what you've cooked up for us this week, Lucy. So, Lucy, what is the background and I hope to God psych for Mommy (laughs) Dearest Crimes? (laughs) I've got psych because uh, there is yeah. psych. Mm-hmm. Um, so like we said at the top of the episode, we have done similar topics before. We've done mom crimes for episode mm-hmm. 195. Mm-hmm. And we also did daddy crimes for 185. Yeah. And we've done like case updates on some like mommy dearest stuff. But we haven't done any of we haven't done the case that I'm covering today. That's for goddamn sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did I did cover like some psychology and some kind of mommy stuff in both both of those episodes, but I am trying to avoid repeating. Um, so if you want more of this content, check out 195 and 185. Perfect. According to Medical News Today, mommy issues often refer to quote problems forming or maintaining healthy adult relationships due to a person's insecure or unhealthy relationship with their mother or another female figure in their childhood. Mm -hmm. This does not necessarily mean that the mom was the bad parent. Sure. In fact, an overprotective or overly permissive mother-child dynamic can have its own kind of toxicity. Mm-hmm. abusive or absent or best friendy or super doting or whatever the parenting style might be can be on you know either end of the spectrum or anywhere in between mm-hmm. the parents behavior impacts how the child sees themselves and their place in the world as an adult so was this weird for you to research as a new parent like did this make <laughs> kind you of. think about <laughs> Oh, yeah. When Junie gets older, Mm -hmm. I would have to imagine it would. It kind of... It's fucking stressful. I I mean, parents are incredible. Like, I'm not cut out for that shit. I mean, (laughs) I think so far, I'm a good mom. You're doing fucking great. You're crushing it. But uh, doing this research, especially, I was just like, uh, I mean... Like, I'll set her down in her chair so I can, like, go poop. I don't feel like I'm abandoning her. Even You're if not. she's crying. And that's, it's not the same. But, but, uh, but, like, you know, she naps on me all the time. Am I being mm-hmm. overly permissive? You know, it just, I don't think that I'm falling into uh, <laughs> any kind of cycle where she's going to have, like, fucking issues when she gets older. I also think right now it's a little too early to, like, ascribe 
these things it's, because like an infant's needs are so different from a toddler and then yeah. a preteen and then a teenager like parenting evolves mm-hmm. as the child gets older too yeah it's definitely and too so early you're just meeting her basic fucking needs right now it's definitely too early to be spoiling her a thousand percent it's mm-hmm. not possible to spoil an infant no <laughs> definitely Jesus. not but yeah like thinking about like the next few years and right. uh, well the next 18 years and like until she she's an adult Mm -hmm. then it'll be really interesting to see because i feel like i am exactly like my mom Mm -hmm. so if june is you have a great relationship with your mother too i really do you really do i think i'm a i think i'm a pretty pretty well functioning adult yeah you're doing great Mm -hmm. i mean i would trust you as my emergency contact I'll be your emergency contact. It's all right. My sister is my emergency contact and my husband. Probably for the best. I don't even think I have like your mom's cell phone number. (laughs) (laughs) That's fine. But yeah, I can name (laughs) 10 way worse moms than my mom. Oh, for sure. (laughs) Me too. Yeah. Got a great mom. Yeah. But like as the child, you look at your mom, your parent, and you're Mm -hmm. like, Oh, that that's how adults behave. Mm-hmm. Like that's how that's how I'm going to behave. That's how sure. I will be as an adult. So even if it's subconscious, even if they're very young, they're not like actively thinking these things that that is what they are. They're learning by example. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So um, so the, the p- parenting behavior, if it's not great, it can mm-hmm. lead to. The child as an adult having a negative self-image, low levels of trust, and other like psychologically based issues. Mm -hmm. It's also worth noting that mommy issues can be affected by either parent. Mm -hmm. So many times daddy issues are seen as like a different set of problems. And often it's girl children described as having daddy issues and boy children as having mommy issues. Mm -hmm. I think daddy issues also kind of comes across frequently as like sexual yeah uh, you know manifestations Mm -hmm. whereas mommy issues are more like dependence and Mm -hmm. attachment styles and yeah first of all people tend to use these terms very casually and apply them very broadly because they themselves are not clinical terms right also we i know we've talked before it's often the opposite sex parent that has the biggest social impact on children and yes Mm. we will get to sigmund freud don't worry Oh, God. I think that the two concepts like mommy issues and daddy issues are sort of kept separate because your mother arguably is the more important parent early in a child's life. Sure. And so the the way that their behaviors manifest and are reflected in the children's psychology can be different. Mm -hmm. Like you were saying, attachment styles versus you know, how how women are taught to be respected by men, by their And I think it's also whatever. obviously worth noting that these conversa- this conversation that we're having is based in research that is more widely available. And we understand that that research really does focus on heteronormative families. Oh, yeah. And this is by no means a reflection on same-sex couples or gender-fluid couples, queer couples, and their ability to parent or, Mm -hmm. like, what role they step into for their child. Um, Just for the sake of this episode, things will likely be more on the binary for this segment because of the research that's available, which is, like, problematic in and of itself, obviously. Mm -hmm. But we only have what, what we can find to work with. And a lot of this research took place in, like, the first half of the 20th century. Right. So same sex couples having kids was like unheard of. Yeah. And they, and besides that, they were not studying those types of relationships because they were illegal. Yeah. (laughs) Weren't too many out, out and proud in the open. Good God. In 1944, psychologist and psychotherapist, John Bowlby wrote about how the different forms of attachment, like attachments developed with a mother in infancy directly correlate with how adults behave. Mm -hmm. He worked closely with developmental psychologist Mary Ainsworth and found that specific aspects of how a mother interacts with their child can lead to different attachment styles in children later on. Mm -hmm. They found that there are four attachment styles that can occur in a mother-child relationship. So tag yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, here we go. 
We have Take this fun quiz. <laughs> mostly bees. <laughs> We have a secure relationship. So people with this attachment style are able to form secure and loving relationships with other people. They were shown love as a child and felt safe and secure with their caregiver. Mm -hmm. Then we have anxious insecure. There's mine. People with this attachment style have a deeply rooted fear of abandonment. (laughs) (laughs) They are often insecure in their relationships and worry that their partner will leave them. I'm not worried that your partner is going to leave you. Uh, I'm not necessarily either, but I definitely have. This is definitely my attachment style. And, you know, I've been in therapy for a long time. I I don't. It's not like an abandonment issue that comes from my parents. My parents were wonderful, loving parents that provided for me and made me feel loved and safe in my home. Most of it honestly comes from like medical trauma that my dad went through when I was a young teenager. And so it was losing his leg. Yeah, losing his leg and potentially losing his life. And then Mm -hmm. eventually he did lose his life. That's more where it came from. And then my role in the household at that time kind of became by default as sort of like an emotional regulator because things were really intense in our house. And like, you know, there was depression and anxiety and like we had a lot going on. And so I know that as a result of that, something that I've worked through is like, I am very anxious about other people's emotions in a room. And that that definitely comes up in my marriage where I like ask my husband all the time, like, are you mad at me? Or like, are, are, did I do something wrong? Like, because I'm that's just like that's childhood shit that I just developed. Mm-hmm. So, I'll, it's you know, it's worth noting that like these attachment styles can come from all kinds of different life experiences and trauma that you may experience that aren't just from you know, a parent, your doing mother something holding you up. when you were an infant, exactly putting yeah. you down to shit for too long. <laughs> so, you know, it's just these are interesting concepts, but like, oh, my God, I, the, the amount of deep diving I've done into my attachment style of where it comes from is bottomless. <laughs> this is very self-aware. Very, yeah. very good that you know this already. I'm not not a mess. Oh, no. But you also <laughs> need a lot of validation and tend to be clingy, as is the end of this anxious, insecure description. There it is. I don't know that I'd call you clingy. I'm less on the clingy end, but I definitely need validation. And mm-hmm. I need, like, verbal communication. And, you know, my husband has been really great about, like, meeting me where I'm at and vice versa for him. But, mm-hmm. yeah, the validation thing, absolutely I fucking need it. Big yeah. time. <laughs> well, you give it, too, so. I do give it. You do. <laughs> you do give validation. <laughs> and I love you for it. <laughs> I love you too. I feel so secure with you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we might have a lot of trauma, but didn't come from each other. No, we're good. <laughs> okay. So the next one is avoidant insecure. Mm-hmm. So people with this attachment style have a fear of intimacy, usually because they were ignored or had their feelings invalidated by their parents. Mm. Like, I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, this can come up a lot if some uh, a, a parent or both parents have kind of a short fuse or a temper. Mm-hmm. You want to avoid conflict. You're scared of, you know, creating drama or getting a, an adverse reaction in your house. That's mm-hmm. a very real thing. And leads to that fear of intimacy. Mm-hmm. They tend to have difficulty developing trusting relationships and prefer to rely on themselves for emotional support. Mm hmm. Then, last but not least, we have the disorganized, insecure people. Uh oh. So people this sounds like me on the surface. You were definitely that second one. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. So people with a disorganized, insecure attachment style have a combination of both anxious and avoidant attachment styles. Mm -hmm. They can be clingy for affection and for their partner's time, but they also tend to push their partners away and feel like they can't trust them. Yeah, that's not me. They crave love, but they're afraid to give it and also to receive it. Do you feel like you know where you fall on that scale? Or do you identify with any of those? I mean, I feel like I'm a pretty... I I think I'm a secure... I would 100% agree, having been friends with you for a very fucking long time. Yeah, I feel like I don't have issues trusting people. If anything, Mm -hmm. I trust people a little too much. (laughs) As far as like the uh, relying on um, people who prefer to rely on themselves for emotional support, 
I would mm-hmm. more more closely identify with that, which would be the sure. avoidant insecure. Mm-hmm. Just because I don't know, I just well, I mean, it's also we, sort of like an introvert uh, qu- quality characteristic, I think too. A thousand percent. I think you and I both have that s- a similar quality of when like we're really stressed or overwhelmed, we kind of want to like revert inward mm-hmm. and like isolate and just like take a beat. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that's coming from a place of insecurity. Mm-mm. Not necessarily. It's just how we process. And may- sometimes it's not healthy because we should be asking for help. But sometimes it's just you need a fucking break. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> sometimes you just need a fucking break. <laughs> just a fucking break. <laughs> you know what We're I want really for Mother's Day? A fucking break. <laughs> <laughs> you and guys. a McMuffin. <laughs> Thank you for joining us as we process through a lot in this episode. We're laying it all out. Woo! Oh my god. Maybe I, I should have gotten wine. <laughs> Not a regular mom. I'm a wine mom. I'm a wine mom. I think for the most part, you and I are both fairly secure because we definitely had trusting, loving, caring, safe relationships with our parents. Yep. Growing for sure. up. We're we're very lucky. We are very lucky in that way. Okay, so there are five main signs of having what we might call mommy issues. Mm -hmm. And again, while each case is dependent on multiple factors specific to one's childhood experience, mommy issues can be characterized by the inability to experience deep connections, clinginess, the inability to be affectionate, being overly critical, Mm -hmm. and also dependency. Okay. Mommy issues also manifest differently in men versus women. Again, talking on the binary here. Mm -hmm. In men, some signs can include always needing to stay in contact with their mother Mm. or never wanting anything to do with their mother. Mm -hmm. Could be uh, having a disrespectful attitude towards women, insecurity, cheating, or Mm. and or a sense of entitlement. Okay. In women, some signs can include low self-esteem, difficulty trusting others, having very few female friends, mm. and uh, having difficulty setting boundaries. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it can manifest differently. Again, there's a lot of overlap between so-called mommy issues and daddy issues. Right. Um, but at the end, it's just about it's about attachment styles. Mm-hmm. So usually when we think about mommy issues, we often think about Sigmund Freud and the infamous Mm -hmm. Oedipus complex. Uh, God damn it. I'm such a Freud hater. (laughs) I know. (laughs) I can't. It's so gross. He's everything is just about dicks and And sex and yeah. God. I know. So it's too much. According to uh, oh my love, our Encyclopedia Botanica, the Oedipus complex was proposed by Sigmund Freud as part of his theory. That childhood can be divided into psychosexual stages. Everyone that, wants to fuck their mom. Ugh. Or their or dad. dad. <laughs> mm-hmm. So these stages are differentiated by the child's supposed sexual fixation on different parts of the body. Mm-hmm. The psychoanalytic theory refers to a desire for sexual involvement with the parent of the opposite sex and a sense of rivalry with the parent of the same sex. <laughs> Okay. I find that so disturbing. I know. And unrealistic. And like, what fascinating, I mean, a child comes out of your cooch, <laughs> feeds off your titty, you got to hold them a bunch. Mm-hmm. I mean, a, bo- it's a, a body's just a body. The sex is only one par- part of uh, your whole body. I mean, Freud's theories were more about him than they were about other oh, yeah. people. I think he got super close on a lot of shit. And to the point where it's like everyone wants to have sex with their mom and their dad. Like, okay, no. But your parental figures are often, like we talked about earlier, the example of how adults treat each other, how adults in a romantic relationship interact with each other, like how it's, you know, what the expectation is. Mm -hmm. That is completely true and makes sense. Yeah. I just feel like Freud takes it to such a gross place. (laughs) Like kids aren't thinking about sex. L- little children are not no. thinking about sex. No, and they shouldn't be. They shouldn't have anything Something's to do with it. Something's probably 
gone wrong. And, and because like everyone wants to explore their body and like see what can fit in their nature's pocket or like see how hard they can tug their yeah. ding dong it's doesn't mean not they're sexual. It's not sexual. Yeah. We all experience exploration, figuring out what we've got. How many how many us. Barbie legs you can fit up your butt. Exactly. <laughs> Four. Just kidding. Yeah. Minimum. <laughs> Minimum. Um, gross. Okay. <laughs> so he attributed the complex to children aged three to five. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Oedipus complex, and said that the stage ended when the child started to identify with the parent of the same sex and repress their sexual desires for the parent of the opposite sex. So apparently between the ages of three and five, you start to change. You're, if if it's a girl child, you're going to hate your mom and want to fuck your dad. Oh, God. But, but when you turn five, that goes away because you identify more with your mom. Great. Thanks, Freud. Yeah. If the child has a decently loving and non-traumatic relationship with their parents, they will pass the stage quickly. But if they have a traumatic relationship with their parents, then they will experience what he called infantile neurosis, which is characterized by internalized conflict that leads to the to anxiety and adult neurosis. Okay. The term sure. this term was originally used used to apply the concept to boys, hence Oedipus. Mm-hmm. Um, the equivalent in girls is called the Electra complex. Mm-hmm. So the Oedipus complex, if you weren't in the same English class as me in high school. And me. <laughs> is originally named after the Greek myth of Oedipus, the Theban king who unknowingly kills his father and marries his mother. They had mm-hmm. children after together. Being blinded. No, he blinds himself at the end. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. He had they had children together, but Oedipus eventually finds out the truth about his marriage once he and his mother realize they are they are married and their relationship to each other. She hangs herself and mm-hmm. he takes off her her brooches from her That's regal right. dress and gouges out his eyes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, high school English was a trip. A trip. So there are some famous examples of mommy issues in media. Mm-hmm. We have Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, which is a movie that came out in 1960. Mm-hmm. In this movie, Norman Bates of the Bates Motel develops a split personality after killing. His controlling mother and her lover out of jealousy. Mm-hmm. Ooh. <laughs> out of guilt and grief, he stash- stashes his mother's corpse and assumes her personality when he commits crimes against women he becomes attracted to. Oh, it's such a great movie. <laughs> Ari Aster's Bo is Afraid that came out oh, last year. My God. Have you seen that? Yeah. I. I don't it's think a, I was really challenge. following it very well. It's a very challenging movie with a lot of like cultural references from the Jewish community that we may not understand. Uh huh. But it's really fucking good and it's fascinating. I mean, and I, I think I'm Joaquin gonna... Phoenix is badass, but like, is it Patty Lapone who plays his mom? Yeah, I think so. She, her performance, <laughs> I, I've never seen fucking anything like it. I, I'm going to have to it watch it again. Incredible. I'm going to like read a review that just like yes. thoroughly explains it and then watch it, it again. Read more about this movie and then watch it again. But it, it it's a challenging movie. It's a commitment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like three hours long. It's three hours long. It's like pretty wildly surrealist slash realist. Mm-hmm. It's it's confusing. It's very confusing. But it's beautiful and the performances are incredible. And if you can like take in yeah the the some of the message that mm-hmm. he's trying to convey it's fa- it's a fascinating movie i loved it i also really like i mean ari asked like midsummer and uh hereditary there was yeah. so much deeper into it yes. that that's why i can watch those movies over and over correct there's just but so I much f- I think Bo is Afraid didn't do quite as well because people were expecting something like that, something linear with a story that made a lot of sense that was easy to follow. And this definitely falls like in the realm of psychological horror, but it is definitely more of like you're getting his view of 
childhood trauma and how that affected his life. And like, you don't know what's real that he's experiencing and what is it. And then she, Patty Lapone is like actually a mastermind behind like manipulating him and doing all this wild shit. It's so unhinged. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's really fucking cool. Well, that's what I'm saying. If I have like read something about it and can like kind of know what to look for, I bet right. it's just packed with like his Easter eggs. And yeah. Thousand mm -hmm. percent. It's a cool movie. Well, in this movie, the main character, Bo, Joaquin Phoenix, deals with a lot of anxiety, guilt and sexual repression that stems from a particularly over involved mother son relationship. Mm hmm. Another one, we have Greta Gerwig's Lady Bird. Mm -hmm. Came out in 2017. Like Such a sweet movie. Mm -hmm. But in this movie, the main character, Christine, goes through a coming-of-age situation in which we learn more about the emotional abuse she's experienced from her mother and how it's impacted her. And like at the end of the movie, when she's getting on her plane to move to, I forget where she moves to, New York, maybe. Mm -hmm. And like the mom just keep, she just like gets like, Kicks her out of the car and the mom like kind of just like drives around and I don't know, it's yeah. sad. It is sad. It's really sad. And it shows a good perspective of not only how that affects her daughter, but then like what the mom is losing mm -hmm. by behaving that way. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a good movie. Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's also a movie that's not only about that. No. I mean, it's about so much. Yeah. But yeah, that's an important part of it. And it like it's it really makes the ending a lot more heartbreaking than mm -hmm. it would be without it. Um, and of course, I had to put in a bit about the 1981 biographical psychological drama American cinematic masterpiece that this episode is named after, Mommy Dearest. Oh my God, I was waiting for this. <laughs> this movie is wild. And the fact that it is biographical yeah <laughs> we're well i'm gonna get to all that <laughs> so directed by frank perry this film stars faye dunaway mm -hmm. as actress joan crawford it is one of faye dunaway's most unhinged and incredible performances she of all fucking time. it's iconic so i'm just doing this with my eyebrows like yeah subconsciously Yes. Her brows. I know. They're so at attention. They're, they're so sharp. They're so amazing. So Faye Dunaway plays Joan Crawford, whose abuse was described by her adult daughter, Christina Crawford, in Christina's 1978 autobiography of the same name, Mommy Dearest. Yep. So Christina, her actual daughter, wrote a book mm -hmm. about how fucked up and the, her household was. And the and book how was made into this movie. Yeah. Um, also, I had no idea that this movie is often considered to be one of the worst films of all time. God, that's not true. It is true. I don't true. care who said, no, I don't believe that. At the second- I mean, I believe you that people say that. This movie's fucking incredible, well, and everyone who says that can eat a pile of shit. At the second annual Golden Raspberry Awards, it was nominated for nine categories- and it won two, including Worst Picture and Worst Actress. That's bullshit. I have to wonder if the subject matter, because Joan Crawford was someone who was so revered and protected in Hollywood, and there's, I'm certain, controversy over these allegations from Christine. Oh, uh, we'll get to it. That the movie got panned more than it deserved because of that. Uh, one thing that I read was that, like, audiences uh, thought it was supposed to be a comedy. What? Like, audiences were, like, laughing because it, because her performance was so outrageous. And some of those scenes were pretty ridiculous. Strap yourself I in. I mean, to me, it, it wa I've seen that movie a lot of fucking times. Mm -hmm. I have never taken it in as comedy. I take it in as horror. Yeah. It is a horror movie mm -hmm. to me. It's, it's creepy. I, yeah. Um, okay, so here's a little bit of the background. If you've not seen Mommy Dearest, what the fuck? We'll just frame for frame recreate it for you right now. Here we go. And <laughs> action. Um, okay, so Joan Crawford was a very successful dancer and actress in the early 20th century she was under contract at MGM and then later 
she broke that contract and went to one of the other big production movie houses. I forgot which one. Mm -hmm. She was married to the president of Pepsi for a while Mm -hmm. and served on its board of directors until 1973 when she was forcibly retired after her husband died because she Mm -hmm. was a real fucking pill and a woman. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. She had been married and divorced three times before the Pepsi guy. Mm -hmm. And she had five adopted children. Mm -hmm. The oldest of these children was a girl who was adopted in June of 1940. This is a, this is taken from Wikipedia quote. Mm -hmm. The child was temporarily called Joan. I think Mm -hmm. while she was being adopted, but then she was adopted by Joan Crawford. So we can't have that. Yeah. So there can only be one. So Joan Crawford (laughs) changed the girl's name to Christina. Mm -hmm. Christina's mother was a 19 year old unmarried girl who had oh, moved? No. Who had moved to L.A. with her family? Christina's birth mother uh, co- contracted with a baby broker mm-hmm. for Joan Crawford to adopt her after her birth. There was something about um, she had to go through some like weird loopholes because you can't adopt a child from L.A. if you live in L.A. at the time for some oh, reason weird. or something okay. like that. So they had to like go through some weird. Maybe not super legal, a baby broker. Yeah. While married to Philip Terry, who was not the Pepsi guy, it was a different Mm -hmm. guy, the couple adopted a son whom they named Christopher, but his birth mother learned that the child had been adopted by a celebrity and attempted to blackmail Joan Crawford for money, Mm -hmm. which resulted in Crawford giving the child back to his birth mother, who in turn placed him back for adoption. Oh, these poor kids. The couple adopted another boy who they named Philip Terry Jr. And then after their marriage ended in 1946, Crawford changed that child's name to Christopher. Stop. So she didn't want this technically the third adopted child because the second one she returned. Wow. She didn't want that boy to have her ex-husband's name. So she changed that child's name like into his life. These kids. So that's These Christopher. Poor fucking kids. Who's the other boy who's the boy in the movie? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Joan dies on May 10th, 1977, from a heart attack. And in 1978, the next year, Tina publishes a memoir depicting yep. her mother as a quote. Cruel, unbalanced, alcoholic mother with Crawford's other twin daughters, the, re- the all of their household staff and their family friends denouncing Christina's book as sensationalized fiction. Mm. So nobody else is backing her on her claims that she makes in this book. Not even Christopher? Mm, Christopher, maybe. Mm-hmm. Actually, yes, Christopher did... Uh, side with Christina, and I'll mm-hmm. get to that. But the other two children who were twins, because remember, she adopted five kids. Yep. She returned one of them. Jesus The Christ, oldest yep. two are Christina and Christopher, Christopher. And then there's two girls who are younger. Yep. So, again, more from Wikipedia. In the book, Christina alleges that Joan Crawford placed far more importance on her cinematic career than her family life, and that Joan later was an alcoholic in the 1960s. She Mm -hmm. also claims that Joan had sexual affairs with various men whom Christina was required to call uncle. Isn't that gross? I hate that. Christina claimed that Joan's controlling behavior continued throughout Christina's adulthood, asserting that Joan was jealous of Christina's acting career in the 1960s because Christina was on a soap 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 opera. opera. Yeah. Like a pretty prominent one, I think. It was called The Secret Storm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... Joan was jealous to the point of taking over Christina's role in the secret storm while Christina was in the hospital recovering from an operation to remove an ovarian cyst. That part of the movie is wild. I know. It's wild. I mean, holy shit. I'm definitely, I try to be a reasonable person and I believe Christina mm-hmm. and, not but, And the truth always lies somewhere in the middle. This was an expression of Christina's experience, which comes with how her 
memory or her processing has been affected by the trauma of her childhood. Mm -hmm. And so it may not have looked to other people in the household the exact same way that it looked and felt to Christina, but that doesn't invalidate her experience. That's how I feel about it. There are also some uh, parts of the movie that were not in the book and were never claimed to have happened by Christina. They sensationalized some stuff for the movie for sure. So like the chopping down of the the rose bush at the tree. I did in my house. We had these hideous shrubs and I could not fucking look at them anymore. And I got like an ADHD manic episode at like 1130 p.m. and put on a headlamp and just went outside and started digging these hideous shrubs out of my front yard. (laughs) Yup. Your current house? Yes. Oh, my God. They needed to fucking go. And, you know, when I get the desire to do something, if I don't capitalize on it, then I may never get that motivation again. So, of course not. I fucking rolled with it. But it was unhinged, and we were the new neighbors with the headlamp (laughs) pulling the plants out (laughs) in the shroud of darkness of night. You're so creepy. I love it. Yeah, I know. Um, Also, the infamous wire hanger scene. Mm -hmm. Not in the book. It it was in the book, and it never, it didn't happen. Um, So the, (laughs) the book culminates with Christina learning that she and her brother Christopher were intentionally disinherited upon the death of their mother for, quote, reasons reasons known to them. So basically, she cut them out of her will right before she died, possibly because she knew that Christina was writing this book. Mm-hmm. Also, possibly just because a lot of those allegations might have been Could true. Could have been true. And yeah, she's just exactly. a horrible person. It, yeah. It's, mm, um, so, yeah, we may never know. Mm-hmm. But again, if you've never seen Mommy Dearest, please do yourself a favor. Yeah. And, you know, Joan Crawford and whatever abuse she is alleged to have inflicted on her adopted children was like not created in a vacuum. She's also a product of a lot of trauma Mm -hmm. and a lot of fucked up shit, both in and outside of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, being being an adopted child by itself can have a lot of challenges. And And, trauma. Yeah. So. And I think that this was just, not just, but that there's obvious generational cycles perpetuated here on unwilling and unsuspecting children that were adopted into her home. I didn't know about the second adoption and that boy essentially being used as blackmail by Mm -hmm. his birth mother and then adopted out again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's fucking horrifying. Horrifying. And then that second boy getting his name changed because she hated her ex-husband. I don't know. The whole thing is very... It's messy. Very fucking messy. So It's messy. Good classic examples of mommy issues there. and uh, <laughs> Extreme examples. Yeah. I'm glad that you and I got to dig into our own, <laughs> our own upbringing a little bit. Oh, I have absolutely loved this. So (laughs) thank you so much. Thank you. That was pretty fun. And my case is horrifying. So. (laughs) Well, let's get to it. (laughs) I would recommend bracing yourselves during our quick break and uh, coming back ready for more traumatic Let's do it. I'm totally ready and prepared. You're not. Y'all, it's 2024. We are done with uncomfortable undergarments and uncomfortable shapewear. We're not doing it anymore. So support, see what we did there, for today's episode (laughs) comes from Honey Love. And like, no matter what you're going for, Honey Love is the go-to for all things shapewear and undergarments. Honey Love has revolutionized compression technology so you no longer have to feel like you're suffocating while wearing shapewear. Plus, they won't ever roll down. These are my summer go-to for like underskirts and dresses, especially when I'm on my scooter. It protects me from chafing. It keeps me feeling covered, you know? Mm -hmm. And no matter how much you groove on the dance floor or scoot on your Vespa, that's not going to roll down. 
Honey Love Shapewear features lingerie-inspired design details that you'll want to show off and is made with breathable fabric. Hello, summer protection in breathable fabric. Get out of here. That keeps you nice and cool. For a limited time only, you can get Honey Love on sale. Get 20% off your entire order with our exclusive link, honeylove.com forward slash wine. So support our show and check them out at honeylove.com forward slash wine. Tell us more, Lucy. Yeah. Oh, so Honey Love is mostly known for like shapewear, but all of their things are I am hooked on because of just how smoothing everything is. Oh, their bras are so comfortable their, too. Their bras are insanely comfortable and like I, I don't know. I got I got I have very unique tooties. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you do. <laughs> they're very unique. They're gorgeous and. Uh, the smooth the, the cup one of my cups may may overflow with sometimes or maybe mm-hmm. the other one there's like a gap and with honey love this is one of the only bras that i have that you can't tell like mm-hmm. it just it's so smoothing like amanda said this lingerie inspired fabrics it's just gorgeous and i do have to talk about their best selling shapewear which is their superpower short love those yeah so it has targeted compression technology that distinguishes between areas where you want a little more support a little scooting up and areas you need like less compression like mm-hmm. just let your beautiful curves shine you know their signature x targets and sculpts your midsection without squeezing those natural curves it's designed to work with your body not against it so it's not like you know, take a deep breath. Or you need two friends to like right. put it on and then shove you in, peel it off at the end of the night. Mm-hmm. No, it fits so well, especially considering the fact that it doesn't roll down, which yeah. is absolutely unheard of in shapewear. So it's got flexible boning that's hidden in the side side seams. Mm-hmm. It just feels like it's like molded to your body in the best way. And this piece also has like. A boot, booty lifting technology. I love the booty lifter. You know I have a lot of booty. This stuff makes my booty look BBL, baby. It looks fantastic. So they got mm-hmm. these boost bands on the back of the thigh, which gives your bum just incredible shape. It's like a bra for your butt. It kind of is. And the last, I love the it. last thing I'm going to praise about Honey Love, because there's so much, but like in the middle of a party and you got to go to the bathroom. Yeah. Don't worry about it because uh, their power short has a 100% cotton gusset. So you can just, you know, do your thing without taking mm-hmm. the whole thing off. Mm-hmm. It's got a convenient opening in that area for a very easy, quick bathroom trip. It's not going to take you 15 minutes to get in and out of this stuff. Yep. So With a line full of angry people yes. tapping their feet at you. So no matter what your event is or even if you're just scooting around town and want to look real cute. Mm-hmm. Honey Love is the perfect plus one. Treat yourself to the best bras and shapewear on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com forward slash wine. Use our exclusive link to get 20% off honeylove.com forward slash wine. And after you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. So please support our show and tell them we sent you. Shape your life with Honey Love and treat your undergarments. Trade them. So last summer I went to the Arts Festival, which is like my favorite weekend of the year here in Des Moines. Mm. And I got this, the coolest print. It was made by this like old Japanese technique where they like paint an actual fish and then cool. and then put like a fabric down on it. So it's like a fish stamp. Oh, cool. It's so gorgeous. And like the fabric that it's on is just so detailed. And I fell in love with it. But I was like, man, I want to get this framed in like the best way that I can still see mm-hmm. all of those details mm-hmm. immediately without hesitation thought of Framebridge I sent it in with their secure packaging that I like trust I trust with my child yeah just pack Junie right up in there yeah I went through all of their beautiful frame options I chose like a really good one that looked kind of like retro Japanese-y sort of so it like Whoa. fit the style got it back so fast and it is one of the f- my favorite things I have hanging in my house Framebridge is literally the best. I love it so much and it's so easy. So you can just order online at framebridge.com or you can visit a Framebridge retail store. They make it so easy, especially the online process. You upload a digital photo for them to print and then 
You can also mail an item like Lucy did using their free, secure, prepaid packaging. Or you could take that item or I think even do the, the digital stuff in one of their 20 plus retail stores. It's on my bucket list to go to a Framebridge store. And then Framebridge custom frames your piece in their studio using the highest quality materials and ships it to your door in days for free. Like ready to hang. All you need is a hammer and a wall, baby. It's so easy and affordable to custom frame just about anything. The pricing is so fair and transparent and upfront. Mm-hmm. It's based simply on the size of your item. So by the time you're approaching checkout, like you know what it's going to cost you, which I really appreciate. There is a beautifully curated selection of frame styles with design experts on hand who make it fun to choose the perfect frame. I have so much option overwhelm as an ADHD girly. In a good way. In a great way. But I love working with the designers and be like, this is kind of the vibe I'm going for. And then they make recommendations on what frames would fit that aesthetic. And I just think it's so nice and helpful. The service is so fast. The shipping is free. And this is phenomenal for gifts, but also like get it for yourself because, you know, (laughs) treat yourself. Uh, And they have a happiness guarantee. If you're not 100% happy with your piece, they will make it right. Their customer service is truly phenomenal. We love FrameBridge. See why FrameBridge has been trusted to frame over 2 million pieces. Visit FrameBridge.com or a local FrameBridge store to get started and custom frame just about anything. That's FrameBridge.com and treat your walls. Shout out to Claritin for supporting this episode and providing us with samples. Y'all, I don't know how many of you listeners are in the Midwest, but like at least in the the United States, it's spring allergy season. Yeah. And while I have gotten like pretty accustomed to the allergies that are normal for me here in Minnesota, I always get new spring allergies, especially when I travel. Yeah. It is so annoying it's like suddenly it's just put a your allergies have just put a damper on your whole experience and then you're like wait am i sick are these my allergies why is my nose so stuffed up why are my eyes so red why can't i enjoy my dinner because i can't taste the food that i have saved up to go try at this amazing restaurant it's not fire It's not. It's really not fun. So honestly, I use Claritin D and you should too if you are an allergy sufferer because luckily for those of us who live with the symptoms of allergies, we can literally live Claritin clear with Claritin D. I love having this in my medicine bag. Yeah, so this double action combination of prescription strength allergy medicine and the best decongestant available relieves sneezing, a runny nose, itchy, watery eyes, an itchy nose and throat, and sinus congestion and pressure with ease. Truly. Some things I love about Claritin D as well is their fast symptom relief starts working on allergies with nasal congestion in as little as 30 minutes. So if I've like landed somewhere new and I start to notice like, uh oh, I'm allergic to something on your plants here, people. I could pop that and I'm going to start getting relief in about half an hour. And You can get non-drowsy relief of allergy symptoms, especially good when you're traveling and you want to experience a new place. With Claritin D, you can still make the most of your day without compromise. So if you are ready to live life as if you don't have allergies, it's time to live Claritin clear. Fast and powerful relief is just a quick trip away. Find Claritin D at the pharmacy counter. Ask for Claritin D at your local pharmacy counter. You don't even need a prescription. Go to Claritin.com right now for a discount so you can live Claritin clear and use as directed. Okay, so this is a brutal and heartbreaking story. Okay. I know I know that many folks have heard this. It's quite famous specifically because of a viral photo that we will get to. Um, But, you know, in the event you're listening and you have not heard this story and uh, possibly have seen the photo but don't know the truth behind it, we'll break it down. I don't know what you're getting at. When when you see the photo, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm just going to dive in here. Married couple Jennifer Jean Hart and Sarah Margaret Hart. Sarah's maiden name is uh, Gangler, but... They end up married, so... Gangler. Gangler. Began their relationship at Northern State University while both majoring in elementary education. Uh, This was in North Dakota. When was this? uh, Well, they were together but not married yet. They met at college in the early 2000s. Sarah graduated in 2002. Jen left school without graduating. Okay. 
Jen was the bigger personality of the two women. Uh, she was confident, funny, a bit in your face. Uh, Jen is the Amanda, if we were tagging ourselves, but we shouldn't. <laughs> She's because... the anxious, insecure attachment, whatever yeah, it was. These women did unspeakable things, so we shouldn't be tagging ourselves. Ooh. But if I were tagging myself, I'd be the Jen. Okay, I'm the other one. Yep, Sarah was more sensitive. She'd be <laughs> nearly in tears during high pressure days when they'd count inventory at work. And I, I literally wrote the Lucy, but we still definitely are not tagging ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've cr- I've cried doing inventory before. <laughs> Who hasn't? Inventory is a nightmare. It really is. It's awful. It's awful. Go in this dark room and count shit. And if you get it off or get it wrong, you have to start over again. <laughs> Launch me into the sun. Anyway, okay. In 2004, the couple moved to Alexandria, Minnesota, and both took jobs at the now defunct Herberger's department store. I remember Herberger's. I do too. Good shit. Mm -hmm. Their move to Minnesota brought freedom to their relationship. They had been closeted in South Dakota, calling each other friends or roommates, but they felt safe to come out and be open about the nature of their relationship in Minnesota. But we're not allowed to like them? No. Okay. And these are like gays on the surface that you would really want to like based on like their presence online and their, they posture, we'll get to it, but they posture themselves as like woke white women who, like, loved Bernie Sanders and cared about the environment. And it was... I just wanted to cheer for them getting to live their lives openly now in Minnesota. Sure, that's great. And they also are not good people. Okay. Because monsters come in every shape, size, gender, (laughs) color, political affiliation, religious affiliation. There's always... Both sides of the Bernie divide. Yep, a thousand percent. A thousand percent. It's There's not just like one set of criteria that can make people do heinous shit. Mm-hmm. Same-sex marriage was still not legal in the state of Minnesota in 2004 uh, at that time. But they committed to each other and started making plans to expand their family. In the summer of 2004, they temporarily fostered a 15-year-old girl. We'll kind of get back to her a little later. <gasps> oh, my God. I know what case this is. Yeah. This was a, on the surface, a joyful and exciting experience for them and solidified that they wanted to adopt children. So Sarah continued working at Herberger's while Jen worked miscellaneous odd jobs before becoming a stay-at-home mom in 2006 in preparation for the adoption of three siblings in 2006. The children were named Marquise, Hannah, and Abigail. Uh, Marquise or Marcus, I'm sorry, excuse me, Marcus. In 2008, they adopted three more children, also siblings, Devante, Jeremiah, and Sierra. These were all young black children ranging in age from two to six years old at the time of their adoption. And it is relevant to acknowledge that the children children were black and the adoptive mothers white because racism is very much involved in this case. It's also insidious and ever-present and we'll get to how it pertains here. So the now family of eight moved to Woodland, Washington, where Sarah takes a job as manager at the local Coles. There's eight of them because the child that they were fostering was not adopted by them, which we'll get to. So they adopted six children. There's the two of them. The eight of them moved to Woodland, Washington. So one of the siblings? No, the the first child, the 15-year-old girl that they were oh, fostering right, was right. not a sibling. Okay. And they did not adopt her. Okay. But they adopted two sets of siblings, three and three, from two separate families. Got it. Okay. Still devoted to becoming legally married, but not able to do so in Washington at that time, the entire family traveled together to Connecticut for Sarah and Jen to wed in 2009. At that point, they had been together for 10 years. They then returned home to Washington, and life continues on. But folks in their community started to notice some red flags in their parenting style. According to a child welfare report from Oregon, Jen estranged herself from those who criticized or commented on her parenting, and Sarah followed suit. Quote, Jen wouldn't have anything to do with you if you disagreed with her, said one relative. But to get a clear picture of what exactly these red flags were, we need to back up and start with their foster child. So prior to adopting, the Hearts had fostered a 15-year-old girl in the summer of 2004. The foster that had brought so much joy and confirmed they wanted to adopt a family. Well, according to a co-worker slash friend, 
they immediately started complaining about this child. A 15-year-old foster child. Like, things are not going well for that kid. Uh Uh-uh. If you are in the system at all, but, like, imagine the trauma that that poor child brought into their household and these parents, foster parents, are just bitching about her. Saying things like, quote, she's the worst and saying that she would eat food out of the garbage, which is something that this little girl, who is now a woman, denied ever happening. She was still being fostered by the Hearts when they were planning to adopt the first set of siblings. And according to her, the Hearts had told her that they would foster her until she aged out at 18 and showed her pictures of the children they were planning on adopting, talking about how she would be a big sister oh and that she God. would need to set a good example for them. She and it was, got excited. Yeah, it was very exciting for this child. She was looking forward to She's gonna have having family. allies in her home and having family in the form of siblings. Oh. And a week before their first three children were due to arrive, the Hearts dropped this girl off at a therapist appointment and never picked her up. Oh, my God. They left her there. (gasps) That is so cruel. They had the therapist tell her that the Hearts would not be coming back for her. And when she was transferred to another foster home, her belongings were already there, making clear that the Hearts had planned this out and just not told her. Oh, my God, that is so fucked. It's so cruel. It's so cruel. Oh, my God. She would later tell the Seattle Times about feeling abandoned and devastated. She had lived with the Hearts for less than a year and was told that she'd be staying and getting siblings. And that it's that fu- would be her last stop before she aged out. Yep. This It's just, it's fucking heartbreaking and bubbles up like a rage in me that I can't put into words how... Sp- some people just treat children like they're disposable. Trash. And these are the most vulnerable children among us and need to be taken in with so much care and competence and commitment. And not be further victimized like that. Yeah. And you dumped her at a therapist's office and transferred, all, sent all of her shit to a new foster home. That's so just, awful. It just makes me feel sick to my fucking stomach. <sighs> The first three siblings adopted were Marcus, who was eight, Hannah, who was four, and Abigail, who was two, in 2006, from Colorado County in Texas. Their placement came on March 4th, 2006, and they were adopted that same September. So September of 2006, they were legally adopted. The second three siblings to be adopted were uh, Sierra, Jeremiah, and Devante. Sierra was three, Jeremiah was four, Devante was six, and they were from Houston, Texas. So their biological mother, the biological mother of the second set of siblings, had lost custody due to substance use issues in August of 2006. These children were initially placed with their aunt, Priscilla Celestine, under the condition that they not have contact with their biological mother. Priscilla loved these children. She wanted these children. She moved into a five-bedroom apartment in Houston to accommodate them all. But she was also taking on the role of a single mother and she was had to work full time to support these kids. And she was in a desperate situation and got called into work and she found herself in a bind for childcare and had their biological mother who was in recovery and not oh. using come in and baby babysit. But this coincided with a visit from a caseworker. It was just like totally random that a caseworker showed up while the biological mother was there that's so sad when shit like that happens. And it's, it's like, fucking tragic. I and so I understand and appreciate that there are caseworkers involved and stuff right. like that, but it's like she's just at the wrong place, the wrong time. It really fe- it really fucked shit up in this. It really fucked shit up. And I obviously I the children's best interests will always be always needs to be the priority. And I think it can be argued that the children having contact with their biological mother, who is actively in recovery and working on, you know, treating her her substance use disorder is in the children's best interest. And I think sometimes the courts just don't have the capacity for nuance in these situations. Mm -hmm. And now because their biological mother came to babysit for a few hours. And, and knowing knowing what we know happens in this case yeah, too is it's just it's just fucking sad. It's just fucking sad. So because of this visit, the children were removed from 
Miss Celestine's care. And this prevented Priscilla Celestine from obtaining permanent custody of the children. They couldn't even be adopted by a stable member of their family who wanted them. And they had been with her for only six months. And then in another six months, they would be moved across the country to start living in Minnesota with the hearts, strangers, white women who they've never met. Yeah. Priscilla continued to fight for the children for three and a half years, but was stymied at every turn. She sought the help of attorney Shonda Jones, who, after reviewing and taking her case, felt strongly that racism in the foster system was playing a role here, with the powers that be ultimately deciding that two progressive white mothers in Minnesota would give these kids a better life than any of their black family members. Quote, I don't believe that Miss Celestine had ever had as much as a traffic ticket. She went to work, home, and church, she says. The court seemed to have had a complete disregard for her. Sherry David, the children's birth mother, who had been clean from her cocaine addiction for eight years, said, quote, they're so quick to snatch children from people like us, she said. Mm. But once they're adopted, they don't even check on the children. And this case highlights serious problems in the child welfare system with systemic racism playing a huge role and lack of ongoing care playing another. So, quote, in our system, once a child is adopted, we equate it with success and there is very little follow up, said University of Michigan law professor Vivek Sankaran, who advocates for children's rights. Quote, we actually know very little about the well-being of how kids from foster care do after they're adopted. That is too true. And really scary. Mm -hmm. So couple that lack of follow up with like white privilege and things that are bound to fall through the cracks. And we get into a situation like this. Quote, for the hearts, it seems likely that their whiteness netted them multiple passes despite all the warning signs, wrote Michigan State University professor Stacey Patton in the Washington Post. Another in issue in this case, and my God, there are so many, was the agency the children were adopted through. So months after the adoptions were finalized in September of 2009, the private adoption agency, which was called Permanent Family Resource Center, located in Fergus Falls, Minnesota, was cited for dozens of violations, including failures to conduct adequate home studies. In September of 2009, the, sp the state put PFRC's operating license on a two-year conditional status, an action that, quote, indicates repeated and serious violations of licensing standards, according to a spokeswoman for the Minnesota Department of Human Services. And then in 2012, PFRC was shut down entirely for dozens more such violations. Jesus. And this is the agency that the Hart family was working with. Oh, God. So, so much stuff just got overlooked. They just didn't care. Now, if you haven't already been thinking this, you might be wondering, how did this family afford six children with Sarah being the only one with a job working now at Kohl's as an assistant manager and earning around 45 grand a year while Jen was the stay-at-home parent, mm -hmm. allegedly homeschooling the children? Well, Sarah and Jen appeared to bring in as much as 41000 additional dollars a year from various payments intended for the children's well-being through various programs. The family received $2,000 a month in unspecified, quote, adoption assistance, had collected approximately $270,000 from the state of Texas, and two of the children yielded about $11,000 a year from the children's, quote, stepfather, who is still paying child support. So Texas allegedly, or at least at this time, holds parents responsible for children in foster care, but it's unclear why these payments continued after adoption. There seem to be endless systemic missteps in this case that just allowed the hearts to continue not only profiting off of the children and it seemed it seems very clear to me that the money was an incentive and they continuously sought adoption through this sketchy agency in Minnesota that would source children essentially through Texas yeah. that had these lucrative kickbacks that is so creepy like it's i understand horrifying why there are incentives to foster and adopt kids. Of course. Of course. And that support is is necessary. But uh, there are a, lo a lot of people who just use it as like a foster farm. Well, right. And it's just another point of frustration and anger that we have this trope created about the quote unquote welfare queen. Mm hmm about specifically black and brown people abusing state and federal support systems mm -hmm. and cheating the system while the hearts 
two, you know, affluent, nice white ladies are fucking doing this in a really damaging way. Yeah. Right under the noses of all of these systems and no one even bats an eye about it. It's just the 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 dis- disparity is so obvious in this case and highlights so many issues. Mm-hmm. It's hard to fucking clock all of them. And I know that I will miss them because I'm I'm also a white woman. But it's just like it's important to look at this shit. Mm-hmm. Most families who adopt children out of foster care from Texas get monthly payments that range from four hundred to five hundred forty five dollars per child to help cover care costs until the child turns 18 which is likely why all six were adopted from Texas. They weren't exactly raking in cash from these adoptions, but the Hearts did have debts and some financial troubles, and these financial incentives kept them afloat. Mm -hmm. So the systemic red flags have been glaring, but alongside all of this, so were the personal red flags with the Hearts, specifically Jen. In a 2000... She was, like, obsessed with social media. In a 2006... She's the Amanda. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) In a 2006 Facebook post, Jen dramatically described her first night as a mother of three, saying Abigail urinated everywhere and gashed her chin falling down the stairs. Hannah smeared feces on the walls and gorged herself with food until she needed the Heimlich, resulting in episodes of projectile vomiting. Marcus, she said, hit his head on a closet wall and in multiple voices claimed to be possessed by demons Yet she and Sarah were committed to healing the kids over time. Quote, if not us, who, she wrote. Oh, my God. Over the years, and we have no way of knowing if fucking any of that happened. Like, sure, maybe they had a rough night the first night that these three children. The first fucking night. And your first night as a mother of six. Yeah. How easy did you think it was going to be? Right. But, like, it's pretty understood that she fabricated a lot of shit on Facebook to paint a very specific picture of a white savior couple Mm -hmm. who had taken in these black children and they were so troubled. Yep. And they're overcoming and healing them. I I want to fucking rip my my hair out. That's so gross. Over the years, Jen, Jen Hart cultivated a carefully curated social media presence that portrayed her family as socially conscious and most importantly, happy and healthy. Quote, a tribe, yuck, that wouldn't be broken apart by an uncaring world filled with prejudice. Her social media posts were filled with photos and videos of the family on cross-country adventures and at the various festivals they attended as a cohesive unit. One person referred festivals. to Jen Hart as a, yeah, they like took them to music festivals and shit. Stop parading no. around your literally black children. Literally. Oh my That's God. what these women are doing. I hate it. It's sick. It's insidious fucking racism. Just these children were commodities to them. One person referred to Jen Hart as a, quote, master poster, her long online diatribes filled with her thoughts and feelings about raising a happy family and the challenges of modern day society. <laughs> so now we've arrived at the famous photo that I referred to at the top of the case. It's in the it's on the drive and I believe it will be on the blog. In 2014, during the protests in Portland from the Ferguson decision, which was following a grand jury's decision not to indict the white officer who killed Michael Brown, oh an unarmed God. black man in Ferguson, Missouri. This photo. A photo of Devante, then 12 years old, hugging a white cop went viral and was labeled the hug felt round the world. In the photo, Devante is crying and everyone assumed it was because of the emotion of the protest and the impact of this hug. But in reality, he was crying because his adoptive mother forced him to take the photo against his will. He didn't want to do it so that she could use her black children for social media clout. But she got more than she bargained for. And the children had are, had are already being abused at this point. So, like, that's already going on behind the fucking scenes. And then she forces him to take this photo. And it's like, imagine that child who's in forced to embrace someone that in a perfect world, he could tell what's happening mm-hmm. and they could help him knowing because there had already been visits and reports that came to nothing, knowing that even if he did try to get help from that officer in that moment, it wouldn't have fucking done anything. And he didn't want to take the fucking photo anyway. And the context of just the Ferguson riots and all of yes. that. 
that child is old enough to know what the fuck is going on. Correct. It's it's just that's so fucking. I I like don't have I don't have words for it. It's horrifying. So Jen got more than she bargained for. Jen she had this like inner conflict with wanting to post all the time, but not wanting to get too much attention. So she didn't actually like the attention that this photo brought to her family. And my theory is she doesn't want so many eyes on her that the cracks will show and the abuse of the children will be revealed. I yeah. think that's why she uh, didn't want all the attention. What else would it be? Right. She wants to keep that social media presence right on that line so they can maintain the facade without having too many people looking at the family. Wow. So after this, she actually went on a social media hiatus for about six months. And this prompted their move from Minnesota to Washington because they were like too well known around here in their community after that photo. The social media shit is so fucking cringe at service level on its own. But like knowing the abuse that these children were suffering behind closed doors makes it that much sicker. Mm -hmm. There was, like I said before, there was a very strange juxtaposition where Jen seemed to crave the attention, perhaps due to social media's ability to be curated to say exactly what she wanted and and put out this image of her family mixed with a dislike of the spotlight, like I said, perhaps due to the public scrutiny tearing apart social media lies. But she kept putting them in the spotlight. Like she couldn't they, help he, it. She couldn't fucking she, and they've like invested a compulsion. so much in these six black children. Yeah, but, like, I mean, this they're obsessed with maintaining this image of like white saviorism. Yeah, these white saviors. Mm-hmm. It's it's it has like taken over their entire fucking life. So they they appeared in the hug around the world. They are in like music festival photography. They're in local newspapers. They were in the background of Bernie Sanders speech when the bird sat on the podium. Yeah. Oh, my God. And, you know, they're all in their Bernie T-shirts and like he's meeting them in one of the photos. Oh, my God. I mean, he obviously had no fucking idea. Well, yeah. You know, but like that, this was the image that they were putting out there. Oh, that boy loves his little hat. Yeah. Also, Jen was one of those fucking annoying online vegetarian proselytizers that like would share anecdotes about the family's vegetarian lifestyle online. Fuck yourself. (laughs) But in their, right? Like, you do you, but I don't, don't force me to fucking read about it. But in their woodland home, uh, so, like, uh, investigators had found this after the fact. Chicken, beef, pork filled a bunch of the family's fridge. Clark County investigators found the family's fridge stocked with hot dogs, ham, large packs of chicken breasts, large rolls of ground beef. Like, the freezer had corn dogs, frozen tilapia, pizza snack rolls, all the good shit. Yeah, all the good shit. It's just, like, I know that this doesn't fucking matter, but it's just one more layer of how full of fucking shit these women were. Yeah. like. You couldn't believe a goddamn word they said. Mm -hmm. And just the image that they're trying so hard to put out there is devastatingly predictable. Yeah. Everything she was posting was utter bullshit, Mm -hmm. including this gag inducing post from May 2013 when the family relocated from Washington to Oregon. And she posted an announcement saying traded in the television for the best big screen available. Planet Earth. Oh, go suck my butt. I know, but they had multiple TVs that were recovered from their home. So it's like, okay, bitch, whatever. I It is insufferable. I can't. She also wrote more than once about the abusive world that her children had left behind. She described Devante's birth and early childhood in 2012, saying, quote, born into a world of drugs pumping through his newly born body, weapons and extreme poverty. One would assume his future was bleak. By the time he was four, he had smoked, consumed alcohol, handled guns, been shot at, and suffered severe abuse and neglect, end quote. Devante's birth family has since come forward and denied all of these allegations. She uh, she probably doesn't know jack shit about no, what this- No, she fucking made it up! Yes. She made it up! Attorney Shonda Jones, again, who represented aunt, their aunt, Priscilla, said Hart's account was- Completely false. False. Quote, those are all lies that did not happen. Devante was not born on drugs. I've never heard anything about him being shot at or anything like that. The adoptive mother fed a lie to the public. She fed into a stereotype that reinforced other people's racism. Yeah. Actually, when you were reading her post, I was thinking of that Elvis Presley song. In Mm -hmm. the ghetto. Mm Mm-hmm. 
It's a beautiful song. Racist but the fucking lyrics shit. are so gross. So fucking racist. Yeah. Which, like, we've talked about Elvis. Yeah, I don't need to revisit Elvis. Many of her posts touched on race, politics, and trips that the family went on. Many felt that the children were forced to perform for the camera and had questions about what was happening behind the scenes. One allegation of child abuse from 2013 touched upon Jennifer's use of Facebook, saying that, quote, the kids pose and pose and are made to look like one big happy family, but after the photo event, they go back to looking lifeless. Ugh. Which is so awful. Lifeless. I mean, imagine seeing that play out in a public space or in any space. Yeah, those kids know. They know they're being used as props and it's... They absolutely knew. And that compounds and is part of the abuse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Another person who knew the family reported that Jennifer Hart liked to, quote, parade the children around at music festivals and stage them for photographs, but then gave them little attention otherwise. Sarah Hart also was described in the documents as being, quote, very cold to the children. One coworker of Sarah's told deputies that she, quote, spoke very fondly of Jennifer, but another Coles employee recalled how Sarah said that the Hart children caused her wife emotional stress and that Jennifer, who stayed at home while Sarah worked, would often call about the kids making her crazy and arguing with them. So there's all these different versions of like, no, we're doing great. Actually, Jennifer is losing it and can't, we can't handle these kids. Like all all these people are getting different versions of events. It's because they're just so full of shit that you can't tell what's true and what's not. Right. Although very active in the staged world of social media, the hearts kept actual people like relationships at arm's length in real life, including their own families. They would make excuses or cancel plans. They'd move states or cut people out at the slightest provocation. The allegations of abuse followed them from state to state. But I think that they are a lot of the reasons why they would move. Yeah. So we're going to go over these allegations, starting with Minnesota, which is where they were living when they adopted the children. So they adopted the first set of three siblings in 2006. And then I believe by 2008, they also had the second set of siblings. So at this time, they would have had all six children in the home. In 2008, a teacher observed a bruise on Hannah, then six six years old, left arm and was told that Jen had hit her with a belt. As mandatory reporters, the teacher called police and they interviewed the parents. They claimed, Sarah and Jen, that they didn't know how she got the bruise on her arm, but said that she had fallen down eight stairs in their home. Maybe that's how that happened. Yeah, maybe. Asked by a Minnesota investigator about disciplinary action in the home, quote, the children talked about not getting supper, getting sent to bed without food, being made to stay in bed all day or stand in the corner silent for a long time. Being made to stay in bed all day? All day. Within weeks of these allegations, all of the children were pulled from public school for the rest of the year by Sarah and Jen. They're just hiding their bullshit. That's Correct. (sighs) They were re-enrolled the next fall, but Jen later told a social worker that this was a requirement of the adoption agency. And from a legal standpoint, nothing happens. Them being pulled from school and then re-enrolled later raises no alarm bells. The children are not removed from their care. Cool. In 2010, Abigail said that she had, quote, owies on her back and stomach. And there were bruises on the then six-year-old across her sternum to her belly button and from her mid-back down to the waist of her jeans. Oh, my God. Her whole body's bruised. Yeah, her whole like midsection for sure. Oh my According God. to Sarah, she had spanked the child over the edge of the bathtub due to behavioral issues. Uh, she was charged with malicious punishment of a child and misdemeanor domestic assault. She pled guilty to misdemeanor assault involving one of the children and was sentenced to community service and one year of probation. But they didn't take the kids away. Nope. And this occurred four months after a Texas appeals court turned down Aunt Priscilla Celestine's attempt to adopt the children. Oh, my fucking God. Yep. (sighs) When authorities became involved, all children claimed that they were spanked constantly and deprived of food. Sarah did take responsibility for this, calling it a spanking that got out of control and sentenced like I said, to that one year of community service. I think she had like a $300 fine. And just of note, based on everything else we've learned, it feels like it was probably Jen, especially as that's what Abigail said. 
But Jen was the one who was getting money from these adoptions. So they didn't want to jeopardize that payout. Yeah. And again, gay marriage wasn't recognized at this time. So the other one took the this fall. Is, right. And this is not to say that Sarah is blameless. I, 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 they both engaged in this. And whether Sarah actually struck these children, she allowed this to continue and she matter. covered for her wife. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter. They were both they are both at fault. Mm-hmm. Um, but Jen was the stay at home parent. Sarah was often out of the home. And Jen seemed to wa- be the one who was in control of the whole family, including of Sarah. But again, I'm just noting that because that's relevant to the s- to the story of this case. But they are both equally fucking responsible for what is happening and does happen to these children. In two months' time, in late 2010 and then early 2011, six additional allegations were filed with Child Protective Services in Minnesota. They said Abigail Hart was spotted going through garbage at school and was taking other students' food, and Jennifer Hart was accused of hitting Abigail's head against a wall. Oh, my God. Hannah Hart had a small bruise on her hand for being hit by Jennifer for lying, and Jennifer was hitting Hannah, quote, all the time. Children in Hannah's class were giving her food and she was approaching fellow students for some asking for something to eat. They weren't feeding them. She had so much food insecurity. Mm hmm. These Hannah kids told, are so young. They're so young. <gasps> Hannah told a school nurse that she had not eaten all day. Sarah said that Hannah was, quote, playing the food card, whatever the loving fuck that means. What? Your child is hungry. The food card. The food card. And suggested that they just give Hannah some water. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. Within weeks of this happening at the school, all six children are again pulled from public schools and were, quote, homeschooled from then on. Then they moved out of the state entirely. From what we know, the children were never enrolled in school again. And the family never turned in required forms for homeschooling in Oregon or Washington. So if they were homeschooling them in Minnesota... Maybe they turned in a form just to be able to pull them out of school, but then they didn't even fucking try after they moved. They just didn't put them in school. Wow. Because obviously at school, people are going to question. Yeah. So by 2013, they've moved to Oregon. Oregon authorities are notified of the Minnesota allegations and they open an investigation. When interviewing family and friends, two friends stated that the children were forced to raise their hands before speaking, like in their home. Oh, That they could not wish each other a happy birthday. They could not laugh at the dinner table. A relative also stated that Jen often erupted at the children. The quote, the kids couldn't do anything without getting into trouble, the relative said. Mm. If the kids did anything that she thought was wrong, she would snap her fingers and say, get in the corner, no food for you. Stop. Yeah. A neighbor said, quote, they wouldn't fight or be silly, these children. They were perfect kids, which didn't seem normal to me. It was like they were programmed. Oh. Several people recalled the children walking around town in single file. Other reports stated that the children were small for their ages and appeared underfed. Jen and Sarah told the doctor that they had issues with food from before their adoption and insisted that the children had been small their entire lives. So the doctor expressed no concerns. Oh. Just going to take these white ladies at their word. What's the age range of the kids at this point? They are into their like tens to teens, early teens okay. at this point. And they're tiny. Like we'll we'll kind of get to it. But um, at least one of the children was like 12 and she looked to be about seven because she was so oh they're, my they're so small. God. Yeah. The women co- uh, countered that they were under scrutiny for, quote, being a vegetarian lesbian couple who married and adopted high risk abused children, uh, according to the Oregon investigations. Like, you're just targeting us because we're gay and we took in and we're vegetarians and we're vegetarians and we took in these troubled kids. Oh, my God. They told investigators that they were harassed in Minnesota by people who slashed their vehicle tires, made threats, and egged their home. They moved to Oregon in <laughs> early 2013. To bet none of that happened. First of all, we're Minnesotans. We're deviling those eggs. We're not wasting them on your bullshit fucking house. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Second of all, that's not why you fucking left. You le- you weren't being harassed. You were being investigated for abusing your children, and you fucking ran to Oregon. Jesus Christ. But they're claiming that they moved there in early 2013 to better fit in. Okay. 
Despite the above, interviews of the children revealed no new incidents of abuse, and they did not mention anything that happened in Minnesota, which, like, duh. They're not, they don't want to get further fucking harmed by their moms. Right. According to the investigation, the children, quote, provided nearly identical answers to all questions asked. Six children giving the same answer. Weird. No red flags there. Oh, my God. And all but Devante showed, quote, little emotion or animation. The children disclosed no abuse or withholding of food, and the social workers marked them as safe. The case was then closed. And, like, why is the burden on literal children who are being abused and under the, the control of these adults when other adults are telling authorities that they've, like, gotten a peek behind the curtain and they're seeing what's happening here? Yeah. But the kids said it's fine. In the in, exact same language. In the exact same words with <laughs> faces devoid of emotion or any kind of curiosity or animation. Oh, boy. Check that safety box. Everything's fine here. Nothing to see. God. I, it's just fucking infuriating. They moved to Washington in 2017 after several years of living in Oregon, likely in response to the Oregon abuse allegations, even though the case had been closed. But the heat was on them. Because they, they so, were moving back to Washington? I think there had been kind of a back and forth, or maybe they went from Minnesota to Oregon and then to Washington, and that's where they kind of landed. Mm. They purchased a 375,000 three-bedroom home situated on 2.2 acres of pasture land. Three-bedroom home? Yeah, for six kids. For six kids. Yep. And you know they had their own room. Right. And we'll kind of get to the rooms, but (gasps) this is where they spent the last 10 months of their lives. (laughs) Three bedrooms for eight people is tight, but it's worse than that. I mean, we all can completely understand, especially in today's housing market, not being able to afford the luxury of all of your children having the same bedroom, kids sharing rooms. That's not, we're not judging that by any fucking stretch of the imagination. No, but in this particular context. They're not accommodating their children. Yeah. Police, during an investigation after the shit we're going to get to goes down, concluded that one bedroom belonged to the parents. One bedroom contained a single twin bed surrounded by remodeling supplies. What? And the th- and the third bedroom held two foam love seats and a small mat that the children may have slept on. That the six children may have slept on. Yep. So they don't even know for sure where these kids were sleeping. They had no idea. There were also no keepsakes, posters, personal objects, or anything that indicated the children lived in the home oh my or God. slept in the bedrooms. They could have slept in the yard for all they know. For all we fucking know. The police said the house was orderly to the point of seeming sterile. Quote, none of the rooms were personalized for the children or showed the supporting elements that children lived in the residence. Oh, my. In August of 2017... Hannah jumped out of her second story bedroom around 1.30 a.m. and knocked on a neighbor's door. The neighbors had never seen Hannah before. She was small and wrapped in a blanket with her two front teeth missing. <gasps> Although almost 16 years old, she looked to be around seven. Oh, my God. According to the neighbors, when they answered the door, Hannah darted inside and ran upstairs pleading, don't make me go back. They're racist and they abuse us. Oh, my God. When they saw the whole family outside with flashlights looking for her and calling her name, they shouted out to let them know that Hannah was inside. I have conflicting feelings about this. Uh, They obviously don't know what we know, but and obviously, like, I also don't fucking trust the police, but I feel like I'd be calling the police in this situation. Yeah. Regardless to report something like I, I just I don't know. I don't know. It's just so fucking upsetting knowing what what happens. But. Eventually, an adult child of the neighbors that Hannah's Hannah ran to did call police. Like, so this happens with Hannah. The par- the family that lives in that house returns Hannah to the hearts. Their adult child who doesn't live at home is like visiting with them in the coming days. And they tell their kid this story. And their story is like, the kid is like, we have to fucking call the police. Yeah. They said, quote, I just can't sit with this. I believe those kids are being highly abused. Someone from the county sheriff's office called the neighbors back to ask whether there had been more incidents. And they said the kids were almost always indoors. And she remembers being told, quote, it's not illegal to keep kids inside. And there was no other follow up. There are so many failures all over the place here. It's it's consistent. It's just failure at every fucking turn. 
Mm. March of 2018, the neighbors only saw any of the children again when Devante would knock on their door asking for food, but begging that Jen and Sarah not be told, saying they weren't being fed as punishment and also asking them not to call the police because they would all be split up. Oh, (laughs) yeah, he would. I know. I know. He would ask for bread, tortillas, peanut butter, cured meats, things that were shelf stable. And he had a little box that would be hidden near the fence between the two, the neighboring properties, so that his siblings could sneak out and get food and they could refill the food from the neighbor's box. Oh, my God. They had their own little food bank. A little system. Yeah. He was asking for food nearly three times a day and disclosed to the neighbors that everything Hannah had told them was true. They called CPS again. CPS showed up to check on the Hart family on March 23rd, but they did not get a response at the door. About 45 minutes later, Sarah's Yukon SUV came screeching into the drive. The CPS visit clearly put them in panic mode, and by the next day, the Yukon was gone, bringing us to the tragic end of this case. So I want to clear that up. CPS came. No one was home. CPS left. The neighbors are the ones who reported that, like, 45 minutes later... Oh, okay. The car comes screeching into the driveway. So what we believe to be true is that at least some of the children were in the home and had been instructed not to answer the door for Mm -hmm. anyone if if Sarah and Jen weren't home. And one of the children probably let them know, you know, somebody came to the door. Yeah. And Sarah came rushing home from work. On March 24th, so the day after that last CPS visit, Sarah had been scheduled to open the store where she was working. I'm not sure if at this point it was also a Kohl's. I think they had transferred her, but she was like a manager at at another department store. But at 3 a.m., she sent a text to coworkers saying she was too sick to come in. This same morning, the neighbors noticed that their Yukon was no longer in the driveway and the bright red kayak that was always attached to the top of it had been removed. Cinder blocks littered the driveway, suggesting that the family had crashed into a retaining wall on the property in their rush to leave. Oh, my God. Yeah. Calm down. So the same day, March 24, 2018, the Hart family are in or around Newport, Oregon, around 8.35 a.m. They then continue to travel south. They reach Fort Bragg around 8 p.m., where they remain for the day. So they're in California now. Yep. They've gone from Oregon down to California. March 25th, 2018, Jen Hart is seen shopping at a Safeway in Fort Bragg as she bought bananas, carrots, wheat bread, cereal bars, saltines, and Chef Boyardee ravioli which I don't know if she got vegetarian or meat. (laughs) Do they have non-meat raviolis? I don't know if they do. I don't think they do. Mm -hmm. It's also reported and then later determined that she uh, was intoxicated. At the store? Yeah. March 26th, friend and coworker of Sarah, who had gotten that 3 a.m. I'm too sick to come in text, but then she didn't fucking ever come back to work in the coming days called 911 for a wellness check because no one had been able to contact Sarah or Jen since the text that she was that Sarah wasn't coming into work. She hadn't come in or communicated with work since. And there's probably fucking rumors that of all this stuff. Yep. Everyone around is like actually kind of concerned. Yep. Wow. So on that day, March 26, 2018, a welfare check is conducted, but the home is empty. Empty of people or empty of empty, stuff? Empty of people. Miles away, Jennifer drove the GMC Yukon XL over a 100-foot cliff on California State Route 1 in Mendocino County with Sarah and, uh, as far as we know, all six of the children inside the car. Jesus Christ. It landed upside down and was discovered by some, like, German tourists who were hiking along the beach. Mm. Jen and Sarah were both found deceased inside of the SUV. Marcus, Jeremiah, and Abigail were um, found nearby. It sounds like the way the car landed was close enough or partially in the water. Mm -hmm. And so and it's um, pretty clear that the children didn't have their seatbelts on, (sighs) which was likely instructed by Sarah and Jen. Take your seatbelts off. Oh, my God. Um, And so remains were found nearby that were likely moved due to tides like this is rocky shoreline that. The vehicle had been driven off. Mm. Abigail's body was also covered in bruises that indicated past abuse. Sierra wasn't found for 10 days. Oh, my God. 
Other remains were also found, and DNA testing on a foot that was found would prove to belong to Hannah in January of 2019. Oh, my God. So months oh later. Oh, my God. Devante's remains were never found. Oh. oh. And Devante has, was the boy in the photo? Yes, and one of the oldest boys, and um, seemed to be treated as, like, the favorite in the family. So while I don't think that this is an appropriate situation to be discussing any kind of theories he he has since been pronounced dead but there are s- still like wanted or um searching posters potentially looking for him if in the event that the hearts let him out let him out before annihilating the rest of the family and given i mean maybe it's just me wanting to believe that they are not all gone. I don't know. I'm just getting really emotional, but I I don't know. I don't know what I believe. I I I personally don't think that these women would have done that, even for their favorite kid in the fucking family. Well, I don't think they loved any of them. No. And I, I, I think it's just one of those things where some of the remains of these children weren't found for a while and they're right on the water and there are, you know, animals in the water and I don't know, but I, I, yeah, it's not like I'm, I don't judge what anybody chooses to believe in this situation. I don't, I don't blame anyone for wanting to cling to the idea that Devante could still be alive and just somewhere staying out of the public eye and not wanting to engage with any of this and just living his life. I mean, that would be a miracle, Mm -hmm. but we don't have any evidence to indicate that Mm -hmm. so he was i believe he was pronounced dead by like 2019 so obviously initially folks were like oh my god tragic accident (laughs) but these are modern vehicles that have essentially like a black box so just keep that in fucking mind anyone listening who's thinking about committing a crime in a car yeah there's data about acceleration airbag deployment all kinds of shit So the SUV's internal airbag deploying computer showed that the Yukon had gone from a standing stop, accelerated 20 miles per hour in three seconds with the throttle pressed at 100 percent, like pedal to the metal, for about 70 feet before going off the cliff. And there were no skid marks. She did not attempt to stop. So she was positioned the car, made the decision and hit it. Yep. She positioned the car in front of that area that wouldn't have been walled off. And put the pedal to the metal and drove off the cliff with her family. It's like in the car. Selma and Louise style, but uh, taking six with, children down with you. Exactly. But those women are so fucking delusional. They probably had some sense of like nobility, like, well, we're all going down together or something. Right? I mean, yeah, these women were fucking sick. So God only knows what's going. Th- I mean, I I cannot even trying to go to the darkest of places, put myself in their minds. I can't understand. I can't wrap my fucking head around it. It's too much. Nor should you. Yeah. It's a bad place to go. Yeah. So the toxicology reports showed that Jen's BAC was over the legal limit. It was at about 0.1, which indicates around five drinks that she would have consumed before driving off the cliff. Sarah and at least three of the children had generic Benadryl in their systems. I don't know which children... If any didn't have any drug in their system, it's possible that the tests might have been inconclusive. Well, I really hope that they were knocked the fuck out for all of this. Right. Sierra and Hannah's remains were also found too late to be able to make a determination about Benadryl levels and Devante's Mm -hmm. remains were not found. So we only know that for sure three of them had Benadryl in their system. Personally, I pray to God all of them did Mm -hmm. because if they were maybe asleep, I mean, I'm just like leaping at anything to alleviate some of the fear and horror and trauma for these kids at this last moment. And it's not like this is even all that fucking helpful, but by the grace of God, maybe they just didn't feel a thing and they were asleep. Sarah herself had a toxic level of Benadryl in her system. She had 42 doses and both liquid form and capsules were found in the car. The children's toxicology levels were not toxic, but they were high enough to be 
drowsy or incapacitated because they received as many as about 19 doses of Benadryl, according to the toxicology. Mm -hmm. And the coroner report did say that the children were likely unconscious or asleep based on the level of drugs that were found in their system. Sarah also had Google searches on her phone that included how easily can I overdose on over-the-counter medications? Can 500 milligrams of Benadryl kill a 125-pound woman? And how long does it take to die from hypothermia while drowning in a car? Well, are you drowning or are you dying of hypothermia? I think she's like trying to make sure that That nobody survives. And yeah, and potentially are killed quickly. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Mm-hmm. And that is my case. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm looking at the diagram of the cliff. That is just a cliff. Yeah. It's like a scenic bypass. It's like a you can pull like an overlook. Like an overlook. Yeah. Yeah. It's fucking wild. Boy. Yeah. It's uh, it's too much. And yeah, you can see on that photo how there's not really when the tide's up, there's like no beach at all. It's just it's just waterfront cliff and rock. So they easily could have been washed away, especially without their belts on. Right. Yep. But oh you know, my god! If you pray, pray for those children and wherever they are. They're so god. sweet looking. He's in that cute little hat in every photo. I know, I know. But yeah, it's a uh, hmm. it's a really horrifying story, and it's real. And it just I don't know. It's just it's so wrong knowing how viral that photo went. Uh huh. Without people knowing what was happening and then within a couple years of that picture being taken all of these children are gone well uh thank you mommy dearest for this mother's day gift you're so welcome i don't really have anything else to say (laughs) i don't either i need to go take medication for my brain i might i might go have a glass of wine i might be a a good cry yeah. Anyway, thanks for listening. It's an important case to cover. It I'm is. glad we covered it. Yes. Yes. And, you know, there are people who know like bits and pieces of it. I obviously in in this format can't cover every single detail, but we covered a lot. Mm-hmm. And now you have a full picture of this situation. Exactly what I needed. Yep. Well. Yep. Thank you for listening and. Happy Mother's Day to I'm so sorry. all the moms out there. <laughs> Stay on the road. Don't drive off a cliff. If you're oh, if Jesus. you're getting those thoughts, talk to a professional. Get help. A lot of lot about mental health in this episode. Mm-hmm. Well, yep. All right. Well, well <laughs> bye guys. Thanks for listening. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Wine and Crime. Our cover art is by Danielle Sylvan. Music by Phil Young and Corey Wendell. Editing by Jonathan Camp. Our production manager is Andrea Gardner. For photos and sources, check out our blog at wineandcrimepodcast.com. You can follow us on all the socials at Wine and Crime Pod. If you have questions, answers, or recommendations to share, email us at wineandcrimepodcast at gmail.com. Episodes are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. It is the best way to spread the word. If you'd like to show your support, Support and get access to all sorts of wine-fueled bonus content, visit our Patreon page. Cheers!